Nishta Jia from Preventive Dentist and Endodontist. Today I'll be talking about Access Cavity Preparation. Of all the phases of anatomic study in the human system, one of the most complex is the pulp cavity morphology. That means, among all the anatomical study that you do of all the parts of the body, pulp cavity morphology is the most complex thing to study. Coming to the access cavity definition of access cavity preparation, access cavity is defined as the opening prepared in a tooth. It's an opening prepared in a tooth to gain entrance to the root canal system for the purpose of cleaning, shaping, and obturating. This is given by the glossary of endodontic terms in the 8th edition. Now, as I already told, studying this pulp cavity morphology is the basic necessity for your access cavity preparation. Your eyes will not be able to see what your mind doesn't know. So if you don't know the basic morphology of your pulp cavity, there's no, you will not be able to identify your canals. So they are knowing the basic thing, basic morphology of pulp, like root canal, the pulp chamber, a pulpal foramen, esthenos, accessory foramens, accessory canals, lateral canals, all these things is of greater importance during your access cavity preparation. Coming to the root canal configurations, there are various types of root canal configurations. Among them, two major types of uh, classification is given, one is given by vertices, the other is given by wings. These are the two uh, commonly used flag configurations to identify your root canal system. Among them, vertices root canal configurations has total of eight types in which type one is where it has one orifice, uh, one, uh, one orifice with one canal, exiting at one apical foramina. Type 2 is where it has two orifice uh, where the two canals merge and exit at one apical foramina. Type 3 is where there is single orifice then the canal splits into two that again merges into one and exits at the apical third. Type 4 is where two separate orifice when these two canals exit at two separate accessory foramen, two separate foramens. Type 5 is where there is only one uh, orifice and the canal splits into two and exits at two different apical foramina. Type 6 is two orifice, merges into one, then again splits into two and exits at two apical foramina. Type 7 is one, two, one, two, that is one orifice, the canal splits into two, then again merges into one, then again splits into two. Type 3 is where the canal has three separate orifice and exits at three different apical foramina. Veins classification is simple in which Type 1 is uh, one orifice and one canal exiting that one apical foramina. Type 2 is two orifice that is where the canal merges and exits at one apical foramina. Type 3 is two separate orifice exits at two different apical foramina. Type 4 is one orifice exiting at two different apical foramina. This is your basic uh, types of your root canal in this way. Then among the other things, among the other morphology that you need to know, isthmus is of great importance. Apical foramina, apical foramina, not all the apical foramen will be at the center of your apical third. There are many times where your apical foramina will be present mesially, distally or laterally of the tooth. So you should always consider that you should never force a bigger file and try exiting at the uh, center of your apical third. There are chances that your apical foramen might be exiting at one of the lateral side. So which uh, radiographically you might feel like the file is shorter. But you will be seeing the exit. If you take it in different angulations, then you will be identifying the exiting of the uh, file at uh, the upper. The other things that you should know is lateral canals and accessory foramina. There are many uh, lateral canals and accessory foramina because of which your irrigation plays an important role in filling these accessory foramen. And the last thing that you should consider is your influence of aging on pulp cavity. In younger patients, the volume of your pulp will in greater amount compared to your older patients. In older patients, because of your secondary dentine deposition, the pulp chamber volume will be comparatively less and the canals also will be narrower compared to your younger patients. Coming to the objectives of your access cavity preparations, the main uh, the first objective is to remove all the carious tooth structure. The second objective is to conserve zone tooth structure. You have to remove the carious tooth structure, but 
at the same time we should be protecting the sound proof structure and we should completely de-roof the pulp chamber removal of the coronal pulp tissue we should remove the coronal pulp tissue whether it is vital or necrotic and we should locate all the root canal orifices and we should have a straight line access to the root canal all these objectives holds good for your traditional access cavity preparations see these days there are many other modifications of your uh, access cavity preparations which are very conservatively done so right now the objectives holds good for your traditional access cavity preparations coming to the loss of access opening there are around nine laws for the access opening first law is law of centrality law of centrality states that the floor of the pulp chamber is always located in the center of the tooth at the level of your CEJ. What law of centrality tells is that at the level of CEJ, the pulp chamber is always located at the center of the tooth. Law of concentricity states that the walls of the pulp chamber are always concentric to the external surface of the tooth at the level of CEJ. That means the pulp chamber follows the external surface of the tooth at the level of your CEJ. Coming to the law of CEJ, it should be used as a landmark to locate the pulp chamber as it is repeatable and consistent in its position in any tooth. You should always use CEJ as your landmark to locate the pulp chamber. Now coming to the law of symmetry 1, except for the maxillary molars, both this law of symmetry 1 and law of symmetry 2, we are excluding the maxillary molars. Law of symmetry 1, except for maxillary molars, the orifice of the canals are equidistant from a line drawn in a mesial distal direction through the pulp chamber. That means, imagine you are drawing a line from mesial to distal direction. What happens? What they are telling is, the orifice of these canals are present at equal distance from this line. Law of symmetry 2 is, the orifice of the canals lie on a perpendicular line on a line perpendicular to a line drawn in a mesial distal direction across the center of the pulp chamber. That means imagine you are drawing a line mesial distally. So what they said law of symmetry 1 that your orifice will be equidistant from this line drawn in a mesial distal direction. Law of symmetry 2 states that the line that you have drawn mesial distally you know, if you draw a line perpendicular to this mesodistal line drawn in mesodistal direction, your orifice will be located on this perpendicular line. Now coming to the law of color change, the color of the pulp chamber floor is always darker in comparison to the vertical surrounding dentine wall. That means there is a color difference. See the dif color of your enamel, the color of your dentine is always different. And the color of your pulp chamber is little more darker than your dentine color. Law of orifice location. There are three laws of orifice location. Orifice, law of orifice location 1, 2 and 3. Law of orifice location 1 state that the orifice of the root canals are always located at the junction of dentinal walls and the floor of the pulp chamber. That means the orifices are located at the junction of your dentinal wall and the floor. Law of orifice location 2 states that these orifices are located at an angle. First thing said that it is present at the junction of dentinal wall and floor. Second law is stating that it is present at an angle at this junction of dentinal wall and pulp floor. And law of orifice location 3 states that the orifice of root canals are located at the terminus of root developmental fusion lines. They are basically present at the terminus of your developmental fusion lines. See, if you see this picture, you can see very clearly the developmental roots, it is see, this is your Y-shaped developmental roots at the terminus of your roots the orifice are present. Now, coming to the armamentarium that is required during your access cavity preparation, you definitely need a good mouth mirror so that your uh, illumination and magnification is good. So, you uh, preferably front surface mouth mirrors are preferred. And coming to the burrs, you can either use round carbide burrs or you can use transmetal burrs if in case you are doing an access opening through crown. And in case of calcified too, you can use extended long shack burr. You might require endodontic spoon excavator, endodontic explorers. See, the first picture that you can see here, these are your burrs. 
and this is your explorers this is spoon excavator this is your dg16 and for an additional aids uh, nowadays practice cavity preparation is also done under microscope and sometimes you might require ultrasonic tips so that you can truff around and find the canal there are something called micro openers and micro debriders it is used to locate your orifice and the, and the most important thing is your radiograph you definitely need to have iops that is your uh, periapical radiograph in multiple direction you should not just have one iopia but it should be in multiple direction both straight and in a nasal and distal angulation and cbct is also useful in case of complex cts to the other aids for determining the pulp space morphology you can stain the uh, pulp chamber floor with your 1% methylene dye which will help you in identifying your orifices you can also perform a sodium hypochlorite bubble test in which you will fill the tooth space uh, pulp chamber with a sodium hypochlorite and there will be a bubble generated when the sodium hypochlorite reacts with the organic tissue present at the pulp orifice so when these bubbles start generating at specific places location you will be able to identify the orifices if in case the tooth is vital then you can locate the orifice by the presence of bleeding points and if in case the tooth is uh, necrotic so you will not be able to find this bleeding spots what so in that case you should clean and dry the pulp chamber floor so that you will be able to visually inspect the orifices the conventional access opening which is also known as your traditional access opening mainly follows this principle that is it should have a straight line access and there should be complete deroofing of the pulp chamber if you can visualize this picture you can clearly see that there is a straight line orifice there is straight line access to all the orifices and the roof is completely removed there is deroofing of the pulp chamber so the main principles that is followed during your access cavity preparation is outline form convenience form removal of remaining carious dentine and defective restoration you should always remove the carious dentine and also defective restorations before performing your access cavity the reason behind this imagine what happens you will only remove half of the carious tooth structure or you will only remove half of the restoration so that you will gain the access then you will finish all your root canal then before doing your access filling what you will do you will try removing the uh, remaining carious tooth structure or your defective restorations there are chances that your tooth might fracture at that particular time then if you if you post endodontic rest if you are not if you will not be able to do your post endodontic restoration the whole point of doing your root canal will be a waste so you should always remove your uh, carious dentine and defective restoration and toilet of the cavity should also be considered coming to the traditional access cavities these are the various shapes of access cavities that you will gain with different types of tooths coming to the central incisor in case of central incisor the access cavity will be in the shape of rounded triangle with your base at the incisal aspect so this is your base which is directed incisally and this width of the base is determined by the distance between the nasal and distal pulp horns so you basically your central incisor will have a rounded triangular access opening how do you get this uh, access opening first you should gain the entrance through the middle of the middle third so if you divide your tooth into nine parts the middle of your middle third is where you should start your access opening initially you should uh, start penetrating at right angle once you start only to the enamel after that you can position the burr at 45 degrees so that you will uh, gain the access into your orifice and one thing you should remember is you should deroof the pulp chamber completely so that you will have a straight line access and you should also be able to remove your lingual shoulder always consider they should the main principle of your uh, traditional access cavity is having a straight line access so you should deroof the pulp chamber completely and also remove your lingual shoulder so that you will be able to place the file at a straight line coming to the lateral incisor lateral the access opening of the lateral incisor is almost similar to that of the maxillary central incisor however 
that opening is much more smaller. This so that opening of lateral incisor is also rounded triangle or oval, depending on the prominence of the mesial and distal pulp horns. Coming to the canine, that is opening of the maxillary canine will be in the shape of a oval or slot shaped because there will be no mesial and distal pulp horns present in case of it. So basically your canine will have an oval shaped axis opening. Coming to your maxillary first premolar. That is opening of your maxillary first premolar will be oval or slot shaped. It is wide buccolingually and narrow mesiodistally. See you can clearly see it is wider buccolingually and narrow mesiodistally and centered mesiodistally between the cusp tips. See you can see it is equidistant from your cusp tips and in case of there are three in case of three canals present the outline form will become triangular with the base on the buccal aspect so this is a picture representation so the orifice of your buccal canal will be present exactly below your buccal cusp tip and your palatal canal will be present below your palatal cusp tip this is about your maxillary first premolar coming to your maxillary second premolar the if it case there are two canals present it is almost identical to your maxillary first premolar if only one canal is present then the, ex the buccolingual extension that you gave will be much more lesser than your maxillary first premolar coming to the maxillary first molars these are the most complex because the mo uh, maxillary first molar almost always has four canals the axis cavity has a rhomboid shape with corners corresponding to the four orifices so basically it will be in the shape of rhomboid because of the presence of four canals mesially mesially you should not extend into your mesial marginal ridge and distally you should not invade your oblique ridge you should only extend up to involve in the mesial surface of your oblique ridge but you should not completely involve your oblique ridge that is in case of your maxillary first molar your MB1, the four canals that is present is your MB1 is mesobuccal 1. It is located under your buccal cusp tip. MB2 is located mesially and palatal to your MB1. The distobuccal is located under your central fossa. Palatal is located at the junction of mesopalatal cusp and your oblique ridge. And the point of entry is the center of the occlusal table. It should always start from the center of your occlusal chamber so that you gain the axis coming to the maxillary second molar if in case there are four canals present then it will be the shape will be in the uh, form of rhomboid if three canals are present it will be in the shape of rounded triangle if there are only two canals present then it will be in the shape of oval where it is white bucco lingually coming to the mandibular central and lateral incisors uh, the axis opening will be in the form of triangular or oval depending on the prominence of your mesial and distal pulp horns. Imagine your mesial and distal pulp horns are very prominent then you will have an axis opening in the shape of rounded triangular. If your mesial and distal pulp horns are not very prominent then you will be having an oval type opening. If only two canals are present you should extend the uh, uh, wall into singulum lingually. Basically, it is removing your lingual shoulder. Mandibular canine is also similar to your maxillary canine where the axis cavity will be in the shape, form of oval or slot shaped. Coming to the mandibular first premolar. The axis opening of your mandibular first premolar will be in the form of ovoid. That means it is wider mesodistally than its maxillary counterpart. In maxillary first premolar, how was it? It was wider buccolingually and narrower mesiodistally. But compared to your maxillary first premolar, your mandibular first premolar is wider mesiodistally, much more wider. And mesiodistally, the axis preparation is centered between the cusp tips. It is basically at the center of your lingual and buccal cusp tips. Axis opening of your mandibular second premolar is always almost similar to your mandibular first premolar. Mandibular first molars, the axis cavity for the mandibular first molar will be typically in the form of triangular, trapezoid or rhomboid regardless of the number of canals that is present.
One of your outline form of your mandibular first molar, your mesiobuccal canal will be located exactly under your mesiobuccal cusp tip. Your mesiolingual canal will be located on the same line lingual to your central fissure. Your distal canal will be located distal to the central fossa and the point of entry is always your central fossa. There are chances that there is a presence of your fourth canal called your mid mesial canal which will be present between your two mesial canals and sometimes there will be presence of two distal canals also. Coming to your mandibular second molars, if in case there are three canals present, the access cavity opening will be similar to your mandibular first molar although it will be a bit more triangular than less rhomboid. If in case there are two canals present, it will be rectangular which will be wide mesiodistally and narrow buccalingually. If in case there is a single canal present, it will be in the form of oval and is lined up in the center of the occlusal surface. So all the traditional access cavity preparations were designed keeping in mind that these extensions are done so that you prevent the procedural errors or any obstructions during your cleaning and shaping. So extension for prevention involves removal of your dentine obstructions to extend the straight plane access to the apical foramina or to the primary curvature of the root canal. Basically this was done to facilitate your treatment procedures and to avoid the procedural errors. So the advantages of this traditional access cavity preparations were the visibility was enhanced and improved clinical exploration for chamber floor anatomy and canal orifice. What happens because of the wide access opening you will be able to locate the presence of an extra orifice or you will be able to easily locate the orifices. It facilitates the cleaning, shaping and obturation. It minimizes the procedural errors and also alters parameters of curvature in a favorable way. But there are certain disadvantages also with this traditional access cavity design. That is, you will lose the coronal and pericervical dentine of your tooth structure and it compromises the biomechanical integrity of the tooth and there will be early loss of your endodontically treated tooth. The main reason for this early loss of your endodontically treated tooth is when we are doing access cavity with your traditional access cavity preparation, what happens? Operator needs and restoration needs are fulfilled. That means for operator, if there is a straight line access and improved visibility, it will be easy for him to do. And for restoration also, if, you, if there is sufficient thickness of your restoration, the restoration also will be folded in place. But what happened to tooth needs? That means there should be sufficient amount of tooth structure to withstand the occlusal forces but here the tooth needs is compromised because of which what happens the extraction of endodontically treated tooth is more and more more because of the non-restorability more than the cause of your true endodontic origin the root canals are not failing because of your true endodontic origin that is presence of your bacteria or anything but the failure is more because of your non-restorability. See, your vertical root fractures are also present in case of this. So, to overcome this, the newer access cavity preparations are designed so that the pericervical dentine, 3D ferrule and 3D soffit, 3D is nothing but your three-dimensional ferrule, three-dimensional soffit are preserved in case of your conservative access cavity preparations. You might be wondering what is this pericervical dentine that ma'am is telling from that time. Pericervical dentine is nothing but the dentine near the alveolar crust. This is a critical zone. See the 4mm dentine above to your crustal bone and 4mm dentine below to your crustal bone is very crucial in transforming the load from the occlusal table to the root. So the more amount of your pericervical dentine is retained the uh, for, uh, the capability of your tooth to withstand the occlusal forces is more. So, what are all the minimally invasive access cavity preparations or conservative access cavity preparation is conservative endodontic access cavity, orifice directed dentine conservation access cavity, ninja endodontic access cavity, incisal access, incisal access is 
for maxillary central incisor and all what we used to do we used to uh, enter the tooth suture from palatally but incisal axis is where you will start the uh, preparation from the incisal edge canalily enamel preparation micro guided endodontics and dynamically guided endodontics these are all the other types of axis cavity preparations there are truss axis cavity preparations there are many newer conservative mode of your axis cavity preparations which you will be studying later thank you